Few people in history have an everlasting influence that extends beyond their lifetimes and outside the boundaries of their countries. One member of this rare subset of people was this snobbish, brainy boy who came from an estate in southwestern Imperial Russia, Vladimir Ilyich Yulianov, also known as Vladimir Lenin. Lenin would take the fantastic, mostly academic ideas of the pioneering socialist and communist thinkers and turn them into something that he perceived as suitable for his motherland, the agrarian Tsarist Russia. Indeed, the idealistic vision that he'd preached throughout his life wouldn't come to fruition either at his own hands or at the hands of his successors. Still, the grand communist wave that swept across Russia and the world wouldn't have happened if not for the perseverance and dogged leadership of Lenin. Lenin's family can be considered loosely a part of the nobility class, not high aristocracy, but his family was rich enough to own land and estate, in which peasants rented and worked year-round. His father was the public school's inspector in their hometown, and his mother was the daughter of a rich doctor from whom she inherited considerable wealth and the family state. The arrogant, snobbish youth who enjoyed a comfortable life on his family estate would have his life upended when his elder brother gets arrested by the imperial police for joining an underground cell planning to assassinate the Tsar. He's convicted and summarily executed. The arrest and execution of Lenin's brother in 1887 would have the most catastrophic effect on the family, especially young Vladimir. He'd later join Kazan University to become a lawyer, but would spend the entirety of his university years reading revolutionary texts. He'd then turn to read Karl Marx to get fascinated by the communist theory and join the Russian Socialist Labour Party. As a member of the party, he would embark upon revolutionary activities, catching the eyes of the imperial police, getting arrested on a couple of occasions. Upon his release, he would leave Russia and live in exile voluntarily. In European countries like Switzerland, France, Britain, Austria-Hungary and Germany. All the while he would read, write, theorize and publish his opinions in newspapers, as well as attend conferences, meet fellow socialist activists, attract new followers, and confront those whose visions he deemed detrimental to the communist and socialist movement. Then, in 1903, he would publish his monumental article, What is to be done? That would strike schism within the Socialist Labour Party, one that would culminate in splitting the Russian socialists into two halves. The Bolsheviks, or the majority as he deemed his followers, and that probably wasn't a true thing, and the Mensheviks, the minority. The Bolsheviks would embrace radical change and an active militant confrontational struggle against the capitalist autocratic regime of Tsarist Russia. In contrast, the moderate Mensheviks believed in gradual change and that a dialogue with the regime was possible. And the reason behind Lenin's move was his resentment of how the German Socialist Party participated in the German political scene. They were completely incorporated into the system, joining the House of Representatives and eventually forming the government themselves. However, to achieve those feats, they had to assimilate into the system and compromise their revolutionary values. Lenin despised that compromise. He didn't want the revolutionary values and underpinnings of communism to be diluted in Russia in the same way. That's why he split the Russian Socialist Labour Party to rid it of the moderate elements that could endanger the ideology and future path of the Russian Socialist movement. Lenin was a pragmatist without remorse, 
After splitting his party and presiding over the violent radical section of the movement, he found himself challenged with the tough issue of finding funds for his political faction, one that is hugely unpopular with the people with the money purses. Being a pragmatist, he didn't shy away from relying on illegal activities to secure resources for his party. The most radical and adventurous of the members of the Bolshevik party would plunder, steal, and even coerce manufacturing magnates to pay tributes to avoid workers' strikes. And here, more than anyone else, Joseph Stalin comes to prominence. He was an phased revolutionary committed to Bolshevism and Lenin with a brilliant conspiratorial mind befitting of a mafioso and a future party leader. And it would be on him and Trotsky that Lenin would depend to forward a future for the party. When the revolution of 1905 erupts, after the devastating defeat of the Imperial Navy and Army against ascent in Japan, Lenin rushes back to Russia. He tries to take part in the revolutionary fervor and to preach the Bolshevik ideals among the crowds and the working class. But the imperial police cracks down on the revolutionaries and the Tsar's acceptance of democratic reforms, all of those soon end the revolution and Lenin has to flee abroad once again. However, when the revolution of February 1917 erupts after the devastating defeats of the Russians on the Eastern Front in World War I, Lenin returns to Russia, this time determined to capitalize on the great discontent among the Russians and to seize power. Preaching peace and food, and with the help of Stalin and Trotsky, the two most daring revolutionaries, he coerces all the members of the Bolshevik party to launch a coup on the interim government. And that's of course the one known in history books as the October Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution. With the success of his coup, a civil war erupts in Russia between the Bolsheviks, called now the Reds, and the Whites. And the Whites being a coalition of the imperial forces and the supporters of the interim government. Diplomatically, Lenin faced another grave challenge in the form of ending the war with Germany. He agreed in the brest litovsk Treaty to cede a vast swath of land of Western Russia and the Baltics to the Germans. The land concessions were huge to the extent that the Bolsheviks had to move the capital from Petrograd, which now became almost on the border, all the way back to Moscow, the old capital. All the while, his two favorite henchmen, Stalin and Trotsky, were scoring successes everywhere. Trotsky was particularly more successful and was the rising star of the newly christened Communist Party. He was the energetic star who built up the Red Army almost from scratch, leading the army in successful battles against the Whites and invigorating the general population with his enthusiastic, passionate speeches. And to counteract this increasing popularity of Trotsky in the party and among the populace at large, Lenin elevates his competitor and future arch-enemy, Joseph Stalin, to become the secretary of the Communist Party. And it's particularly this move that would propel Stalin to absolute power in the upcoming decade. During the course of the Civil War and the early days of the Soviet Union, Lenin would prove to be not only a pragmatist, but also a flexible leader. But that didn't mean that he was a benevolent authoritarian. On the contrary, he wouldn't stop or feel deterred at massacring huge numbers of adversaries who threatened the party's rule or rebelled against his power. He was a hardened leader who didn't flinch away from the atrocities of war and the testament of history. He would frequently say that he had studied the failures of the previous revolutionaries, especially that of the failed Paris Commune of 1871, and that to avoid the failure that had befallen his predecessors, he had to never compromise 
on his ideals or goals. Lenin would suffer from a failed assassination attempt in 1918, and then under stress and extreme exhaustion, he would later suffer a litany of strokes that would compromise his health greatly, eventually dying from a major stroke in 1924. However, Lenin wouldn't die until the Bolsheviks had won the civil war, the Soviet Union created, and the communist regime fully entrenched in power. After his death, Stalin would sanctify Lenin as the hero and saint of communism, and he would remain so throughout the history of the USSR. Stalin, of course, is another major player in our Bolshevik narrative, worthy of a story of his own, but that will have to wait for another time. That's it for today. Thank you for listening, and catch you in the next one. Bye.